what Jesus said. I came to tell you what Jesus said. I came to tell you what Jesus said. Repent of your sins and be baptized. Repent of your sins and be baptized. this morning. What a great blessed day it is today to be alive. The Lord has allowed us to uh, come together, even though it may be the way of Zoom, but hey, we thank God that there is a way that we can come together and worship today. So as we always say, this is the day that our Lord has made, and we're going to rejoice together and be glad in it, because he allowed us to be here, and we're so thankful. Amen. And we're going to get ready to just go right back into our service. We want you to join in today. You know you're at home as a praise team. Lead us in worship. Hey, let us worship wherever we are. That's one thing about praising God, worshiping God, and praying at all, that we can do it wherever we are. Amen. God deserves to be praised and to be worshiped and to be thanked most of all. So at this time, we're going to bring back our praise team. They are going to lead us uh, into our time of uh, praise and worship today. Remember as well, today is Communion Sunday, so we'll be also uh, in the service with our communion service on today. At this time, let us join in together with our praise and worship team. I love that man's name of Jesus. 
Jesus. I love I'm you, I'm talking about Mary, baby. I love I'm you, I'm talking pray. about my Lord and Savior. I love to I love pray. to praise His name. I love to I love pray. to praise His name. I love when to I don't pray. have a mother to talk to. I love to when pray. I don't have a father to talk to. I love to when pray. I don't have a friend to call I on. To I call pray. on the name of Jesus. I love to I just pray. pray the next name. I love I just to pray. pray. Yeah, we make a 
thank God for who he is. Amen. He is everything that we ever will need. Amen. He is our God, our Lord, our Savior, our provider, our keeper. Amen. He is everything that we need. And we're here today only because of the grace and mercy of God. And if you have anything to thank God for, which we do, that's not even the truth that everybody has a reason to thank God for. Amen. Things may not always be the way we desire, but we thank God that things are as good as they are. You know, we just finished up the season uh, with Thanksgiving and time that we should put more, we put more focus on how good God is. We understand the very fact that Thanksgiving Day is just what it is. That's one day, but Thanksgiving is every day. We should be giving God thanks. David wrote in Psalms 20. Uh, that you know, one of the one of the uh, verses says that uh, my cup runneth over, and you know what? Our cup might not run over all the time, but everything that's in our cup, we should give God thanks for. He never promised it's gonna run over all the time, but we know that there's always will be something in our cup that we can give God thanks. So that's why it's always a good time to give God thanks. As we said, this is a day that the Lord has made, and we're going to rejoice together and be glad in it. And guess what? We just come out of the Thanksgiving season now. The whole shift in, in the mindset of uh, especially America as a whole in the world, too, is that this time of, that we celebrate the Christmas is all over. Some of the places, we just, hop, we just skip Thanksgiving. Some places, they didn't even do nothing for Thanksgiving. They just came right into Christmas season. Amen. But that's the world's way of celebrating. But we know the true meaning of this time is the coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. TV is full of movies. They got so many Christmas movies all over the place. Everybody got all kinds of Christmas. But none of them, <laughs> I've never seen so much movies about Christmas, yet they dodge around Christ. <laughs> you know, it's amazing how they can do that, but it's being done right now. There's all kinds of reasons for Christmas except for the true meaning that this season that we do celebrate is the season that God came to this earth to become our Lord and Savior and to redeem us. So let us keep that in mind. So that is what we're going to do today. I want you to get your Bibles. Go with me to the book of John. And we're going to look at verses 1, chapter 1, verse 1 through 18. This is what we want to read. And we're, our message today is going to be entitled, God is here. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us, which shall be the foundational part, amen, for this whole month of December, the season that we are celebrating. He is here. God sent Jesus Christ uh, to this earth to be the Lamb of God. And he fulfilled the work of salvation. He did great miracles and things, and he ascended. He left his Holy Spirit here. So God is still here. There was a true statement. God is here. Even though Jesus has ascended, but he had left his Holy Spirit here to lead and God and to comfort us that we are not alone. I am going to read these verses out of the New Living Translation, and then we'll preach from the King James. But it reads, in the beginning, the word already existed. The word was with God. And the word was God. He existed in the beginning with God. God created everything through him and nothing was created except through him. The word gave life to everything that was created and his life brought light to everyone. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness can never extinguish it. God sent a man, John the Baptist, to tell about the light so that everyone might believe because of his testimony. John himself was not the light. He was simply a witness to tell about the light. The one who is the true light, who gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He came into the very world he created, but the world didn't recognize him. He came to his own people, and even they rejected him. But to all who believed him and accepted him, he gave them the right to become children of God. They were reborn, not with a physical birth resulting from human passion or plan, but a birth that comes from God. 
So the word became human and made his home among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the Father, one and only Son. John testified about him when he shouted to the crowds, this is the one I was talking about when I said, someone is coming after me who is far greater than I am. For he existed long before me. From his abundance, we have all received one gracious blessing after another. For the law was given through Moses, but God's unfailing love and faithfulness came through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God, but the one and only Son is himself God and is near to the Father's heart. He has revealed God to us. And in the church say amen. And as we've been reading, amen. Again, we're going to title the message today, God is here. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Aren't you glad, amen, that God chose to send his son to redeem us from our sins? Amen. The greatest. And as we go on through the month, we're going to extend this to the, uh, the series topic entitled, uh, The Greatest Gift of God. The greatest he's given to humanity was his son, Jesus Christ. But well, let's look back here at our text. There were 400 years between the close of the Old Testament and the book of Malachi and the beginning of the New Testament, which picks up with the book of Matthew. Matthew ends with a prophecy of the coming Christ, and Matthew, sorry, Malachi ends with a prophecy of the coming of Jesus Christ. And Matthew begins with the birth of the coming of, of Christ. We can look at the Old Testament. It um, announced him. There was many prophecies all through from Genesis all the way through in the Old Testament announcing the coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But it was the New Testament that delivered him. That's why the New Testament is nothing but the gospel of our Lord and Savior, the story of the coming of Christ and the work that he did here on earth. But at the close of Malachi, Israel was out of Babylonian captivity. Now they were back in Palestine, but now they were under Persian captivity. And later on, they came upon a Greek captivity. And now we pick up in the story here in uh, when Matthew begins, Israel is now under Roman captivity. And when Christ came to the earth, they were under Roman captivity. And guess what? When Christ was ascended, they were still under Roman captivity. So that lets us know that he didn't come just to set them free from physical captivity because a lot of their captivity for the children of Israel, they were always taken captive by other nations when God allowed it because of their disobedience. But they let you know that Jesus came to the earth to save us from our sins. He did not come just to set them free. And that confused a lot of them because they thought that that's what the Old Testament was talking about when they were announcing the Christ that the Messiah was going to come and set them free. They thought they was under that captivity, but it was not the captivity of sin, which is our greatest captivity of all, under the bondage of sin. So when Malachi begins, Israel is under Roman captivity, but during this time, God set the foundation for Christ to come. A lot of things had to line up for it to come, but now we can begin to see how everything was lining up. I want to hear, hear, listen to what Galatians chapter 4, um, starting at verse 4. It's a very good description of this time and season that we're celebrating. It says, but when the fullness of time was come, and understand that only God controlled the fullness of time. He knows his set time is appointed time. God knows those. It says this, but when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, listen to this, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, whereby we can cry out, Father. That describes this season all in just a few lines. There's no better, I think, scripture, we really want to find the totality of what we serve as Christmas season, the coming of Christ, than this right here. 
made of the woman. I mean, that's his version, version, all of that, you know. He was he was part of deity and also part human as well. So under the law, I mean, Jesus was still, he didn't come, so I didn't come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. He, he never changed scripture, he fulfilled all scripture all at the same time. So again, the stage was set for the word to come to the earth and to be made flesh and dwell among us. One of my favorite scriptures in the Bible comes out of Psalms 118 and 22. The stone which the builders refused is become the head of the corner. And it says in verse 23, this is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. What God was doing through Christ when he sent his son here, this was the Lord's doing, the miraculous way that Christ came and all that, you know, uh, it took to bring all this to, this to pass. It was the Lord's doing. It is marvelous, and it should be. Not only was his doing, it was his idea. No man put this together. This came straight from the heart of God to reconcile us back to him for the sins that we get against him. Now, man, I know only God could love another human being as much as he loved us. And when you look at everything that we've done, you know, to him, and yet still, his heart still loves us. That's what makes this Christmas story should be so special. Is the very fact the older we get, the better the story should be. So sometimes I wonder, it's just, you know, I've been done, done that, heard that, I know the story, and we do, you know, we sort of take it for granted. But the greatest love story ever is the story of how God loved his people and what he done to redeem and reconcile his people. God's greatest miracle, the incarnation of Christ. Emmanuel, which means God is with us. Matthew 1 21 says, And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Verse 22 here says, Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Again, this is the Old Testament prophecy about the coming, announcing him. Verse 23 of the first chapter of Matthew says, Behold, take a look, a virgin shall be no child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Where is the miracle in that? Notice what it says. This is this miracle. Behold, a virgin shall be no child. That's the miracle. That, that, you know, in our own lives, that don't make sense. Only God can convince us that's true. And only God can do that. So you can see the miracle. There's just so many miraculous things that will be wrapped around you and I being redeemed and reconciled back to God. What a great God. What a great season. What a time to rejuvenate when we hear about how much our God really loved us and how he proved it. he loved us. Amen? So the stage was set for this to happen. We truthfully, again, let's, let's bring your thing back in, 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 in proper perspective. We truthfully celebrate the event because we really don't know exact down to what day that Christ was born. But guess what? We know that he did. We take it by faith. I mean, he's proof. The word is proof. We see the results of what he does that it happened. I don't have to narrow it down to the Exactly, December 24, 24, 26. But I know that it happened. I know that he is here. Because all scripture points to, even what we just read, you know, that we're going to see the, the virgin with child. All that took place. So everything pointed to his coming. As a matter of fact, in the book of Matthew, chapter 1, verse 17, listen to what it says. All the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations. And from David until the carried away to Babylon are 14 generations. And from the carried away unto Babylon unto Christ are 14 generations. Add that up. That is 42 generations that, you know, God was putting all this into place. Now, in the 42nd generation, Christ is coming. The word is being made flesh to go. God is sending 
his son. So understand this, it is impossible to overemphasize how important Jesus coming to the earth in human form to redeem us is. I don't care how much you say, I'm tired of hearing it, but you know, it's going to change the importance of it because if he had never come, then we would not be sitting where we are today. Amen? We would not be redeemed. We would not be uh, reconciled back to God. <clears throat> he had to come. Why? Because that was the one thing that Jesus could not do from heaven was to die on the cross for our sin. He had to come to the earth to do that. And I'm so glad that he did. I know you always share every year one of my favorite uh, definitions of Christmas that I ever heard. And it says this. I'm about now, I'm going to assume you might still remember where it says the Son of God became the Son of Man in order that the sons of man might become the sons of God. And this is this is this uh, you know one line to describe all that happened here. The Son of God, we're talking about Christ, became the Son of Man, became a humanity, a human form, in order that the sons of men might become the sons of God. And the only way he could do that, he had to come to earth to be the Lamb of God, to sacrifice his life for our sins. Amen. The true meaning of Christmas. He came as a baby, but he grew up to be the Christ, the one that died on the cross, because there was not a baby dying on the cross. That was the Christ, the son of the living God that did it. But how he came, amen, is the beginning of the story. The word was made flesh. God coming to earth in human form is important because I want to share three things that it reveals. The first thing that it reveals to us is the very fact it reveals the heart of God. How deep his love is for us. Have you ever took a moment to think about how much really God loves us? How deep his love is. It had to be deep to do what he did for us in spite of the disobedience of mankind towards him. All the idol worship, all the breaking of the commandments, and all of those things, but yet and still, he sent his son. He sent Christ to show us how much he loved us. One of the most quoted scriptures, for God, what? So loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. When it says world here, he's talking about everybody. All creation. He loved us so that he sent his son to die on the cross for us. Amen. That if we believe on him, we shall not perish, but we shall have everlasting life. Gosh, man, God loved me and you so much that he wants to spend eternity with him. Come on. That's love there. I see it all the time. How many people on this earth that you can pick that you want to spend eternity with? <laughs> That's a long time. So you better choose well. <laughs> Amen. And another scripture in 1 John to sort of show the awesomeness of God love in 1 John chapter 3 verse 1, the writer says behold, means we take a look what manner of love has the Father bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God think about that, he says look at the love that he showed toward us, he has showed the greatest love of all was the love that God has shown toward us amen, this is what should make this time of the year, so much excitement about it. I know we like to look at the lights, look at, but the true light, who is Jesus Christ? The true, true meaning of Christmas in this season is the very fact that God so loved the world. He gave, he sent his son. Amen? That the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. I don't know about you, but I am so glad that God is here. This time of the season really reveals God's heart for us, how much he loves us, Think about it. He had a plan to save us from our sin. Again, that's early. It was his plan. It was not our plan. He chose to forgive us. He chose to redeem us. He chose to reconcile us. We got to get that in our spirit. Amen? And, you know, and we and we won't be so commercialized about this time of the season. I mean, I know it's the spirit. It's a time of giving. Sure, when we think about 
I guess, you know, there's nothing wrong with that because, you know, if we see how much God gave to us, it should be a natural reaction. You know what? God has been so good to me. I want to bless somebody else too. I mean, it, it, I can understand why I say this is the season of giving us because God gave so much. Amen. Well, we, we can't give back what he gave, but he was a blessing to us and we can be a blessing to someone else as well. He made a plan. And here's the other part about it. He came to earth knowing that his number one priority was to be the Lamb of God. That he had to endure the suffering and the pain of the cross to be the atonement for our sin. But guess what? He came to earth. Amen. The Bible says, greater love has no man than this, that he will lay down his life for his friend. Aren't we glad that we are his friend on today? So that's the one thing, the number one thing that him coming to earth proves how much he loved us. His heart of God. Also, in the second thing, it proves the great need that he met in the We sing this song, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Trust me, we were all wretches. <laughs> we were all, we were born in sin. So we were there, we were in a state that we could not save ourselves. But God saw the need, man and woman, we could not save ourselves from the penalty of sin and death. But we know God had one that could. He sent the perfect sacrifice, the perfect atonement. If you really want to talk about grace and mercy, all we got to look no further than Jesus Christ. God's greatest show of his grace and his mercy toward us. Amen. He had mercy on us. And he proved it by sending his grace to die on the cross for us. Jesus was our last and only hope for redemption and salvation. Romans 6 chapter uh, starting in the 5th verse, I said, Romans 5 starting in the 6th verse. We've heard this many times, but hear what it says. A great description of the condition of humanity. It says, when we were yet without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. And we might as well look in the mirror and realize that before Christ came, we were all ungodly. Just accept that. That wretch undone. Only Jesus could fix that. And he says, when we get without strength, meaning we do not have the power to do anything about it. Only God could do something. And we know from the Old Testament all the way through, there always had to be a sin offering for the sins of humanity. In the Old Testament, it was the lambs and the in, in, in the animals that were sacrificed, but in the New Testament, under the last covenant, it was the blood of Christ. He was a perfect sacrifice for our sins. But it goes on to say that for scarcely for a righteous man would one die, for yet preventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. But God commended his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died. That's a good place to say amen. If, you, if that don't make you happy, what will? How many cars do God got to line up in a row? A house and all this maturity stuff. That should never be the same response from us from hearing this. That, but God commended his love toward us. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He came to save us from our sins. And you know for a fact, and even though he came to save us, we accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, but we still have to fight the battle of sin every day. So it is important when he give us the power and the strength, everything we need that we can become overcomers. We have been saved from the penalty of sin and death, and it came through his son, and it started when he sent his son to this earth. Amen. God came from heaven to earth and he dwelt here with us for 33 years before he ascended and went back to be on the right hand of the Father, back to the Godhead where he, it all began. So aren't you happy about it? I'm glad that it, it shows the great need and guess what? We still need God every day. I need you more from just salvation. That, get, that, that, that can get me straight when it comes to heaven, but in the meantime, I'm still living on earth. We still need him. It's the same way with Jesus. He came to earth to, to save us from our sin, but 
But look at all the miracles he did along the way. He blessed us in humanity. When I say us, I'm talking about the people of God in so many ways, and he'll do the same thing here. We got over yonder fixed, but I still need God every day here on earth as well. And the third thing that it reveals, it reveals the mystery of God's plan of salvation. So in other words, the gospel, which is Jesus Christ. It is the heart, it is the center of all scripture. Amen? And what happens is we see God through the scripture. The last verse that I read here in verse 18, it says that he shall, he have declared it. We'll see God really through Jesus Christ. There's no greater example no greater model that we can see God except through the things that Jesus has done for us here. Uh, you know, not, not only then, but even now. He is the, he is the Son of God. So we should be able to, we should be able to see God. Like, like one time, one, and when, what's the time think what scripture that was? Chapter, I think the 14th chapter of John. When Philip said, hey, show us the Father, and that will suffice us. And Jesus told him, look. Have I not been with you so long? You don't watch me do all these miracles. You don't walk with me. And you tell me to show you the Father. And Jesus said, look, when you see me, you see the Father. So, you know, he's doing, he's doing his part. He is revealing God to us through all the great things that he has done for us here on earth. God has come from heaven to earth to show us the way. Amen. Jesus just didn't bring good news. He was the good news. The fact that he was here, you know, he brought good news, the good news of salvation. And you think about it, what other religion do you know that the God that they worship, he comes and, and takes on a human form to die for his people. He saved them. He resurrected himself, and he's going to make a promise to come back again to receive. It's, it's only recorded in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, he will love us to that degree. Normally what happens is the shepherd, the sheep die for the shepherd, not the shepherd dying for the sheep. When Jesus reversed it, our good shepherd, he came to lay down his life for the sheep. Aren't you glad you his sheep? Amen. I, I, the Bible says we are the sheep of his pastor. I'm so glad I'm in the, I was in the right path on that time. Amen. Because he'll lead us down the path of the righteous. And the devil has his sheep, God has his. But where does he lead them? He don't lead them down the path of righteousness. So I'm glad about it. But Jesus revealed to us God's plan of salvation. And in one simple word, it was him. Jesus Christ was God's plan of salvation for us. From the very beginning to eternity, we can always see God. Godly love for us. Amen. Jeremiah 31 and 3 says that behold, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness have I drawn you. And God has kept that all the way through from the Old Testament up until the gospel. It was always his love that has been reaching out to us to draw us back in relationship to him. So we are just so thankful about it. Now just for a moment here in our text, the Gospel of John, it portrays Jesus' deity as the Son of God. We, uh, you know, you go back and, and, and follow Christ's journey as he was growing up and going about to do the will of the Lord. His biggest problem with the other uh, religious people, the Pharisees, the Sassy and all, was the very fact that he declared himself the Son of God. Matter of fact, that is the main reason that they wanted to crucify him was because he just said that he was the son of God. Even though we know that he was a part of the God and the deity of Christ, he, you know, he was conceived, uh, Mary was his mother, but he was conceived through the Holy Spirit, so his divinity was there. And the whole book of John is designed to prove that he is the son of God as he is. But here in this first chapter, here, John uses six titles. To prove that he is the eternal God, that he came to the earth. Yes, he was conceived by the Holy Spirit. He was born a uh, virgin birth. Uh, you know, but the thing about it, Mary baby. He came as a baby, but he grew up to be the Christ. That was his role. Not only did he come here, but it was the work of salvation that he did, which was the real reason he came. And my God, how did he bless us along the way? 
as he would in the same way now. While we're waiting for his return, God is blessing us every day. Amen. So we should be thankful, amen, that our Christ, our Redeemer, was born. Now, when I'm talking about these particular topics, these uh, six titles, I'm just going to name them uh, in short, because as I said, we're going to have a series that will go out the rest of this month where our uh, our evangelists and our elders in the church, they're going to go a little more in depth about some of the very things that I'm talking about here. So I'm not going to dig all into it, but I just want to give them to you that you can look at them. And I, you know, John chapter 1 is one of the best uh, chapters in the, in the gospel to read about. It really breaks down why Jesus was here and the things and the work that he had to do while he was here. So quickly, the first one is, he is simply the word. It says in the beginning, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with him. So again, that right there, that, that answer is the question. You know, I'm not going to go, I'm not going to have to, I'm not going to even waste time going trying to search out any more questions to prove to anybody that he was the son of God. If I don't want to believe this, I'm just going no further. It's just like Going back to Genesis 1. If I don't believe what Genesis 1 and 1 says, then ain't no sense of trying to prove nobody anything else about creation. If you can't believe it, in the beginning, God created heavens and earth. Then what else is to say about creation? Same way he did. In the beginning was the word. And I don't know how far does in the beginning go. Or we can go back. In the beginning. Just like say, how long is forever? Forever. So God here. He's always been here. So you understand, as far as you and I can think back, our intelligence, that should be enough. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. That is the question. He is the Word of God. The revelation of God's heart and mind is always going to be revealed through His Word. As it said, Christ's going to reveal Him. He revealed him through his word, and his word revealed everything that Jesus was going to do for us. So that's why I said it. God is here because the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. If you drop down to verse 14, it tells us, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Look, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. Full of grace. Begotten is always a term that you to describe the virgin birth of Christ, that he was conceived by the Holy Spirit. That's why he was God, only begotten son. And God has only ever had one begotten son, and that was Jesus Christ himself. So he was the word. He sent the word to the earth. The same word that we're reading is nothing but a reflection and a revelation of who Jesus Christ is. So the first title that he was the word of God. Drop down to verse 4 here. Well, this, I'm sorry, let's look at 3. All things were made by him. Without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the light of the, was the light of men. And the light shined in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. So you start here at verse 4. Another time that John used that he was the light. Light that produces life. Nothing lives without light. And I'm glad to know that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ says that he was the light of men. In him was life and the life was the light of men. And the light shined in darkness and darkness covered not because when he came to the earth, so many of his very own did not receive him. That's what he's talking about. They rejected him. Amen? But in verse 9, you know, here, it talks about John the Baptist was going to give a little bit of what he says that the, that was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world and the world was made by him and the world knew him not. He came into his own and his own received him not. During that time Jesus was born a Jew. He came into the children of Israel and he was rejected. Amen. They crucified him because he declared himself to be the very son of God and he's talking about right here. But it don't change who he was or his purpose that he came. Jesus Christ was the light of the world. And he still is the light of the world. But the light that was in him was life. And that light gave life to men. Amen. He came that you and I can live. 
All we got to do is do one thing, accept the light. And look what it says in verse 12. I'm paraphrasing the chapter, but because I, I want you to go back and read it and spend time studying these different, different, different things, these different titles. But look what verse 12 says. This is us as a church. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood or of the will of flesh, nor the will of man, but of God, because it was his plan. He had a plan. That whosoever believe on his son, Jesus Christ, shall be saved and inherit eternal life. We have to accept the plan of salvation by accepting his son, Jesus Christ. Because he was light. The world was in darkness through sin, but he was the light of the world. Aren't you glad about that? The third title, let's just drop that down. I'm going to move a little faster, but let's drop down to verse 29 here. Because of the Lamb of God. Here he is, we find that he says in verse 29, the next day, John sees Jesus coming up to him, and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. This was John the Baptist that was talking. We know as a, we, in the background of the story that John the Baptist was a cousin to Jesus. Uh, his mother was Elizabeth. He was born three months before Christ, but he was to be the forerunner of Christ. He was to prepare the way, and he was doing the very thing. If you read back in this particular chapter, verses 19 over and on down, you will see as he began to declare who Christ was. As a matter of fact, some of the people thought that he was Christ. Uh, he made to the fact, someone asked him, well, who are you? And John said, I'm not the Christ. You know, that's not my role. I'm just one crying in the wilderness, but there's one that's coming after me who I'm not worthy to even tie his shoelace. You know, I baptize in water, but he's going to baptize you with fire. Well, I can't save you, but he can. And, you know, that was him. He was proclaiming the Lamb of God for his purpose. Somebody asked you, why did Jesus come to her? You can turn to the scripture right here in John 1, 29. He says, behold, the Lamb of God. When you say the Lamb of God, that says a whole lot. That covers everything the Old Testament ever said really about Christ. He came to be the sacrificial lamb for our sin. When he says the Lamb of God, meaning he came from God, God gave that sacrifice that God did so love this world that he gave his only begotten son to you and I that we can be redeemed. Why did he come? To take away the sin of the world. Salvation has come. Amen? Because of what Jesus Christ did. He was the Lamb of God. He gave his life for our sin. The fourth title that he gave, look in verse 34 here. Um, the story goes on. I'll be finished. Uh, John is talking about this. Uh, I'll read down to it. Okay. The Holy Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said after me, come the man which preferred before me, for he was before me, and I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest to Israel. Therefore, I am come baptizing with water, and John bare record saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it bowed upon him. And I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize with water. The same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same as he was baptized with the Holy Ghost. John says in verse 34, and I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. Amen. And you see that the word was given to him that if you see uh, the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove coming and sit on someone and stay there, you know that is the Son of God. And guess what? If you go back and look in the book of Matthew, I think it's chapter 3, you will see it happen just that way. As he was baptized in the Spirit, came out of the dove and it rested on Jesus. And then the voice from heaven from God said, this is my beloved son who am well pleased. So you can see, he said, I think that if I said all these things that were spoken in the word of God that was given to him, he said, I know that this is the son of God. Which brings us to a point 
to really celebrate this time in the season. You and I, as believers, we got to, we cannot have any doubt in our heart that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That's one revelation we got to have. This is the Son of God. There's no, you know, I'm fully persuaded because I know the Word of God that says that Jesus Christ is the Son of the Living God. Amen. And we should celebrate it because our God came to the earth in the form of a baby, grew up to be the Christ and to die for our sins. Amen. Good reading. Go back and read Matthew chapter 3, starting at verse 17, and you will see all of that come to play. The fifth title that John gave here is he called him the Messiah. Let's look at verse Okay, we're going to start from 35. And it's again, it says, in the next day, you know that it's the third day that all this been going on. It says, in the next day, after John took and two of his disciples and looking upon Jesus as he walked, he said again, behold, the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him speak and they followed Jesus. Then Jesus turned and saw them following and he said to them, what are you seeking? You know, and they say, Rabbi, which is to be saved, be an interpreted master, where was the Holy Where are you going? And he said unto them, Come and see. And they came and saw where he dwelt and abode with him that day. And it was about the tenth hour, and that's four o'clock in our clock. And one of the two which heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. And he first found his own brother Simon. And said unto him, We have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted for Christ in Greek. And he brought him to Jesus. And when Jesus beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon, son of Jonah. Thou shalt be called Cephas, which is by interpretation a stone. And we know that was a stone, uh, one of the names that Jesus gave to Peter. Amen. So we can see the Messiah. What does the Messiah do? Messiahs deliver people. Moses was the Messiah for the children of Israel out of Egypt, and Jesus Christ is our Messiah now out of sin. He came to deliver us from sin. But here's what we got to get. We got to come to a place in our life, just like uh, Andrew told Peter, you know what? Come here. We done found the Messiah. And he has to get, we got to come to a place. Have you found the Messiah? I mean, that's what makes it perseverance. We have to find him for ourselves. People can point us to him, just like Peter. He told him, I found him, but Peter came to Christ, and he got his name changed. Just like you and I. Look at the process. We come to Christ. Now, we're no longer the same, right? We're changed. Uh, we become a new creation in him. But we have to have that personal experience with the Messiah, which means the anointed one. In Greek, it's just simply Christ. He was the anointed one. That was sent by God. Not only was he sent, but he was empowered and sent by God to do, amen, the, 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 the salvation plan that God had for us. I'm glad that Jesus Christ is my Messiah. The Bible only speaks of it. They don't even call him Moses the Messiah. They say, you, I want you to go in and, and deliver my people. But the Messiah title really has only been given to Christ uh, in Scripture as well. So you go back and you research, and I think it's a couple times in the book of Daniel, and here, here in John, where it talks about that, but I am glad he is our Messiah. He came to deliver us. Amen? From all of these titles, these names, you know, they're different titles, but he's doing the same work in all these different titles. And the last one, I want you to look at verse 50 and 51. You can read on down a little bit further, but uh, it goes on how, again, you notice the progression here, each time we have to get a title that, that adds more and more people are getting together. And it goes on down here. We go down to verse 50. 51, it says, And Jesus answered and said to them, Because I saw you, I saw thee under the fig tree, believest thou, thou shalt see greater things than these. And he said to them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Hereafter you shall see heaven open, and the angels of God ascending and descend upon the Son of Man. So you can see the last title that he gives here, that he is the Son of Man. And 
that means that he was guilty as well as human. And we can understand that. Amen. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. And we come in at. And the book of Mark gives us a lot of more uh, in detail insight about him being called the Son of Man. Amen. He was just human like us in some aspect, but yet he was the Christ as well in us. And Jesus used this title many times to describe himself. And it's something that he really did what I like about it. You never, he just come out and say, well, Who are you? I'm the Son of God. No, he would, he would be wrong. When you say the Son of Man, that's such a humble, you know who you really are in Christ. But he's always been what? Humble and holy, meek and That was just the example that he was set. Yeah, he was the Christ, the key to our salvation, the one that was going to die for our sin. Amen. That we can be redeemed and reconciled back to God. Here again, the six titles. He was the word. He was the light. He was the Lamb of God. He was the Son of God. He was the Messiah. And then he was the Son of Man as well. Again, six titles. Same way. Amen. And he came to earth. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us to be all of this that you and I can be redeemed and reconciled back to God. Amen. Jesus brought the scriptures to life. He was the word, but as he lived it, he brought it to life. Jesus is not just a truth to believe, but he's also a person to be experienced. And this is what we should be doing now. Season. We believe him. We believe the word, but we also experience him because we've been born. Amen. Because we have, we have received his spirit. We have been regenerated. We, you know, we know what it means to really, when you say, I'm saved, I've been born again. It means I have been changed. You know, I'm a new creation in Christ. All this came to pass because he came and he did the work of salvation on the cross for us. As John said earlier in his text, I think it's verse 17, 18, he said, no man is, you know, you know, verse 17, for the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Christ. Big difference between what Moses, Moses is going to do so much, but Jesus Christ gave us grace and truth everlasting life that we have through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So when you make your mind go ahead and think of this, when we talk about the very fact that God has given us the greatest gift he's ever given to humanity, he's given us so much, but think about this, Isaiah 9 and 6, for unto us, a child is born, a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the everlasting father, the prince of peace. All of these are more titles that have been given to him. But again, no matter the title, hey, it's still the same God and the same work that he did. So be encouraged. Let us rejoice in the fact that the word Jesus Christ was made flesh when death among us. The incarnation of Jesus Christ. God has came to earth to deliver us, amen, and redeem us. Let us not take that for granted. So I hope that today was an introduction and an overview for December. As I said, the series that's going to follow is going to be called God's Greatest Gift to Us. And over the next uh, three Sundays month, our ministers are going to share a more the detailed story of God's greatest gift. The Christmas story is going to be told from the perspective that Jesus' birth to his growing up to become our Christ, our Lord, our Redeemer. But today, we want to celebrate these six titles that we've shared today. Amen. As we commune, because it took all of these in order for him to do the work of salvation on the cross, and he shed his blood. The Lamb of God came to die for our sins. Greater love has no man than this. That he would lay down his life for his sin. So we're going to get ready to commune here in a little bit. So understanding that communion is the greatest act of worship. Jesus, again, part of his plan of salvation. Jesus was the one that came up with communion. You know, during the Passover, when they were celebrating, the disciples had no idea what was coming. But when they got done eating the 
Passover meal, Jesus stood up and he took the cup and the bread and he told them, you know, you got to eat this and you drink it. Matter of fact, till you drink all of it because this blood is of the New Testament for the remission of sin. It's my blood that was shed on Calvary. And he said, as often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. But we can't commune correctly and sincerely if we have not accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. It's not a part of us unless we were in Christ. And so then I, I want to bring us into that because if there's anybody out there, as we said earlier, you know, do you know the Messiah? Have you met him? Have you found him? If you don't know Jesus Christ, Lord and Savior, then, you know, community is just a ritual. But to those of us that have been born again, that understand the story, the reason, the blood that was shed by our cross, it is us, I'm not sure, another way that we can also not only believe him, but we can also experience, you know, the, the, the power of being in the new birth, the regeneration. And we do it every time that we commune as a way of saying, Father, we have not forgotten the sacrifice that you gave your only begotten son. And Jesus, we have not forgotten the fact that you shed your blood for us. Amen. With that being said, does anybody out today has not accepted Jesus Christ? I know all the fanfare about Christmas, but Jesus came to earth to put us in a position that we can receive him and receive our salvation. That we can spend eternity forever with the Lord. Amen? If there's anyone out there, the greatest decision that you have to make in life is whether to choose Christ or not to choose Christ. To choose Christ means you choose life. Rejecting him means that you should be dead. As he said here, you know, he came into his own, his own received him not. But here's where you and I sit today. He says, but as unto those that received him, to them he gave power that you can become a son of the Lord, a daughter, a child of God. So there's a lot of power we have, amen. Decision to choose. Choose wisely today. Choose Christ. And that you today, amen, as we get rid of community, you can. Just you know, partake free, like Jesus told his disciples, drink every drop. He drink it. it might not be a big cup, but drink it all. Because they do represent the blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. If you're out there, amen, if you need this further, uh, for us to you know witness with you about this, please reach out to us. We have we have enough uh elders and ministers and evangelists here that we 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 can find time to reach back out to you and do whatever we can to help you. To get a better understanding, amen, about what it means to be to help you walk out your soul salvation with the Lord. The greatest decision that we ever have to make to choose Jesus. He didn't come all the way from heaven to earth, just for us to have a good story to read. He came that we might receive him and be redeemed and reconciled back to God. So at this time, we're going to get ready for our communion service. Our uh, we're gonna come up with a song as you prepare. The man is actually Go ahead and prepare, and they want to. We're going to have a song that's going to be played. Uh, then we're going to come right back and go into our communion service on today. So prepare your hearts and your mind, amen, to worship God for His greatest gift. And the greatest act of love was the sacrifice His life on the cross for us. Change me, oh God. Make me more like you. Change me, oh God. Wash me through and through. Create.
Change me like only you can, Lord. Change me. Do it for me, Lord. Change me. Do it for me, Jesus. Change me.
all the way as he grew up as the Christ, what he became as a child as well as the Christ himself to do the work of salvation. So please, everybody, let's join in. Amen. Spend time. I know some of you heard this story over and over and over. Guess what? It'll never change. I mean, the truth never changes. It's the same story. Amen. But, the, but we rejoice in the fact that what was accomplished, amen, and how God uh, has worked in the life of his people through that story to save and redeem more and more people to hear. So that we just celebrate the fact. If you save, you're going to get happier every time we hear the story because that's our testimony as well. So we thank God for that today. But at this time, I uh, want to bring uh, Sister Tierra. Montgomery, she's going to come. I have a letter that I want her to read uh, to, the, to the church. It came from the Atlanta Food Bank. As you know, I've been asking you ever since the pandemic started that um, we have been sending them out, out of our benevolence offering $500 a month, I mean, each month for uh, to help in that effort. And normally they, they normally send a thank you letter out every month when you do do it. But they have lately they have been um, really uh, singing us out in those letters and they just thought now it's not just a generic letter. They have put our name and everything on there. How much it because of the very fact that most churches only support efforts like that on Thanksgiving and Christmas and they stop. But the very fact that we have been consistently doing this for the last two years, but practically every month that we will send that. And they just want to send a letter of thanks. I just want you to hear, this is where your tithes and your offering, all these things are going to them. So uh, please, we're going to bring her, let her read it. Just give her ear to hear. Amen. Jesus is here. Good morning, church. The letter reads, Dear Daniel, please accept our sincerest appreciation for the support and generosity shown by Liberty Temple Christian Church. Your gift of $500 was a significant investment in not only our work, but also towards creating healthier and more resilient futures for the people we serve in our community. During the height of the pandemic, the number of food insecure men, women, and children in our area rose to almost one million. However, because of the generosity of our community, the number has since decreased to just more than 715,000. A central part of this improvement was due to the support we received from our partners like Liberty Temple Christian Church as it allowed us to provide the food equal to more than 95 million meals last year. The support we received from our partners like Liberty Temple Christian Church is impactful on our work and especially on the lives of our clients, such as Laura and her family. And Laura said, when you can put a can or something in a box and send it off, that can make people smile. It gives them some comfort, some peace. You just think you're donating to a food bank. You're donating to a family. You're helping preserve a family. Helping give family hope, which is what we really all need. Your dedication impacts so many in our community. And for that, we are truly thankful. Your help Sorry. We are proud of our partnership with Liberty Temple Christian Church and would be honored to continue working with you in the years ahead. Thank you for your partnership. Cameron Turner, Director of Institutional Giving at Atlanta Community Food Bank. Thank you. Thank you, Sister Tierra. I just want you to hear and let you know that when we ask for the levels we are, uh, it's our intent, desire to go out and do all we can. And as I said earlier, what made this one stand out more is normally it was generic, but it actually took time to put our name in to show they appreciate that. And I want to extend the same thing back to you, how much I appreciate all that each one of you have given uh, in that effort. Uh, but we're not going to, you know, one day when this, this time, this pandemic, it's going to stop, it's going to cease one day, but we're going to still 
be consistent with our enemy because just because there's not a penny, there's still always going to be people that are hungry. So, and that being said, I appreciate it, but I do want to encourage us on this effort as well uh, because, you know, this coming year, we're doing this for us, for $500 per um, month, but, you know, there are other areas that we really want to be able to, to increase our effort uh, as giving you know, to do ministry work, we're in, you know, we're, we're building a fellowship, we're, we're coming together. There's, 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 there's deals that has to be paid for each church part of it. There are many different things that we need to do, and I want to encourage us as church here living in 2022 that we want to, you know, right step up in our giving. I pay out for those of you that are not consistent and pay with your tithe, pay your tithe, and well, it's offered that the more you give, the better work that we can do out in the world as well, as there's things here in our own home, the church, you know, we have, don't forget about our project to put bathrooms on the front. Our parking lot needs to be repaid badly. Our carnage work needs to be done. Our steeple is rotting on the inside. So there's like, we still have plans to finish our uh, youth uh, uh, section down in the basement. So there's much that we can do, but it can only be done. And through the times, so we're gonna we're gonna pop, talk more about it in the upcoming year. But well, that's one thing I want us in the coming to Liberty Temple that we're gonna step it up in our evangelism, our giving, all of that that we can be a better place. It's only encouraged me. And the key was with this, it was our consistency is what got these people attention. Anybody can throw something once, twice every holiday, they don't give no more. But the very fact that Liberty Temple Christian Church has been consistent. You can get things done. And the same way with us the upcoming year, if we be more faithful in our tithes and offering and giving, we can do greater things. There's much work to be done. So I don't want to encourage us, but I'm telling you now, I'm not going to let it go. This year, we're going to push that because part of our our, our uh, God gave and we should give. Everything that God did not require out of us, no more than what He blesses us. He give us, He bless us that we can be a blessing. To other people as well. But that being said, but, the, but most of all, I want to stick it in, but I do just want to say thank you, Liberty, for your support. And guess what? Today is first Sunday, so today is benevolent Sunday. So let us continue to do that. Amen. Be consistent in our giving as well as our tithes as well. Amen. Father, we thank you today, God, for all that you've done. You've been so good to us. You've blessed us in so many ways. You've given us so much. But God, we today we just focus on one thing. We celebrate the greatest gift that you give us. You chose to give your son. You sent him to earth in the form of a baby to grow up to be the Christ that would eventually save us, sacrifice his life, shed his blood on the cross, and forgive us for the sin to be our atonement to redeem us and to reconcile us back to you. And for that, we are so thankful, Lord. We thank you that he is the way, the truth, and the life. No man coming to you but by him. We thank you that you have given us access to you again, that you have rebuilt the relationship that sin tore apart. Father, we thank you. We give you glory. We give you honor. And we give you praise for all that you have done. But most of all, for your son, Jesus Christ. I pray, God, that Part of your blessing has been that you have the power to heal, to deliver, and set free. You know all the needs of your people. You know the condition, this world. You know all the sickness, the pest, all these things that we're wrestling with. If all this going on, we only know that we can turn it over to you. And this is what we do today, God. We just turn it over to you. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And God, we thank you. We give you glory, we give you honor, and we give you praise. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. And please, everybody, continue uh, as we close out. Watch the screen. We wish you our schedule for the rest of the year concerning Bible study. And also, too, I want to put out a shout out for our first lady. She's totally ahead of everybody. She misses everybody, but she's in London having fun, taking pictures, and sending me pictures every day and seeing everything. But she's having a good time. And we'll be back here on Tuesday. So we have access to solicit your prayer that you will pray that her.
her and her sister Monique, they would have a safe flight back as well. And again, we thank God for the day. Enjoy your week and give God the glory and go out and tell somebody about the word became flesh and dwelt among us in the form of Jesus Christ. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be accepted in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. Go be blessed of the Lord. Yeah.